Good morning. We come together to worship God and to give thanks for the life of Cornelia Huskins Garvey. We celebrate all the ways Cornelia devoted herself to her family, friends, community, and to this family of faith. Cornelia and Wes joined First Baptist on July 19, 1972. When we celebrated their 50 years of membership last year, I reminded the congregation of all the many ways Cornelia served God and our church. She was a deacon, a deacon officer. She served on these committees, Committee on Committees, Decoration, Lord's Supper, Media Center, Music Council, Nominating, Personnel, Policy Review, Recreation, Stewardship, and Leadership Selection. She sang in the choir, and she taught children to sing. She studied scripture with the Life Bible Study class. She enjoyed doing yoga with her friends and serving at lunch at the crossroads. And for years, Cornelia served as our church clerk. That is a role that allowed me to spend the most time with Cornelia. She would be at the church managing the membership records, and we would strike up a conversation. I would hear stories about how she and her sister Betty Jo grew up, or, or she would tell me about some adventure they had shared. The, but most of the time, this time included sharing pictures of her grandchildren and telling me stories about what everyone was doing. Cornelia was beyond proud of the family that she and Wes created. Cornelia also cared deeply about the people in our congregation, so she often called or texted me to make sure that I knew about some need. She also texted me to get a weather forecast from my husband, William, or to simply check on me to offer words of encouragement. She loved us all so well. So Wes, I want to remind you, Hank and Sarah, Joanna and Bill, Thomas, Wesley, Emma, Paige, and Will, of what you already know. You were Cornelia's most treasured gifts. I know that it is unbelievably difficult to say goodbye to this woman who anchored your family and whose love you could always depend on. It was a gift to witness the love, care, and devotion that your family and close friends shared as you cared for Cornelia during her hospitalization. Friends, during this service, we seek God's grace so that in our pain we find comfort, in our sorrow we find hope, and in death, resurrection to eternal life. We trust that God is here with us now, providing the peace and comfort we need for this day and the days to come. Pray with me. Loving and gracious God, we give you thanks for Cornelia's life. We come to you with great gratitude for the gifts and talent you equipped her with to serve you and all those whose lives she touched. Draw near to us now as we remember and give thanks for this beloved daughter of God. We are thankful that you have held us in your strong and tender arms of love since you welcomed Cornelia home on December 14th. May the words of song, scripture, and proclamation remind us throughout this day and the days to come of the strength and grace you so willingly offer us in our greatest time of need. Through your Son and our Savior, Jesus Christ, we pray all these things. Amen.
Hear these words from Psalm 23. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He maketh me to lie down in green pastures. He leadeth me beside still waters. He restoreth my soul. He leadeth me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. For thou art with me, thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. Thou preparest a table before me in the presence of mine enemies. Thou anointest my head with oil, my cup runneth over. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. And these words from Mark 5. While he, was still sleep, while he was still speaking, some people came from the leader's house to say, Your daughter is dead. Why trouble the teacher any further? But overhearing what they said, Jesus said to the leader of the synagogue, Do not fear, only believe. He allowed no one to follow him except Peter, James, and John, the brother of James. When they came to the house of the leader of the synagogue, he saw a commotion people weeping and wailing loudly. When he had entered, he said to them, Why do you make a commotion and weep? The child is not dead but sleeping. And they laughed at him. Then he put them all outside and took the child's father and mother and those who were with him and went in where the child was. He took her by the hand and said to her, Talitha kum, which means little girl, get up. And immediately the girl got up and began to walk out. She was about 12 years of age. At this, they were overcome with amazement. And these words from Luke 2. In that region, there were shepherds living in the fields, keeping watch over their flock by night. Then an angel of the Lord stood before them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were terrified. But the angel said to them, Do not be afraid, for see, I am bringing you good news of great joy for all the people. To you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, who is the Messiah, the Lord. This will be a sign for you. You will find a child wrapped in bands of cloth and lying in a manger. And suddenly there, were, there was with the angel a multitude of heavenly hosts praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest heaven, and on peace on, on earth peace to those with whom God is pleased. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Well, here we are. In the middle of the Advent season, five days from Christmas. A time when we normally acknowledge God's many gifts. Yet today, those gifts are a bit clouded by our grief. The loss of a friend, a wife, a sister, a mom, and Kina. It puts a hole in our heart. And we are empty. Through the prism of our tears, though, we can see Christmas, and we know that God is with us, and we can celebrate the life fully lived, the 86-year life of Corny Darby. In those 86 years, Corny never, ever stopped learning, growing, and living, learning how to love and be loved, how to grow into abundant and full life regardless of her age. 30, 50, 60, 86, and how to live in celebration by looking for the good, by serving others and being an example of God's grace and kindness. Unfortunately, in my clinical practice, I see too many people who are alive but not living. People in their 30s and 40s who are, in effect, like dead people walking, sucking in air, taking up space, but not living. That was not Corny Garvey. She squeezed the life out of every day and every situation. 
always looking for opportunities to try something new or ways to encourage and help others. Corny loved to be involved and have fun. In addition to all those things that Leah mentioned, choir, teaching choir, being a deacon here at First Baptist Church, Corny also played church softball. But having fun usually meant serving and connecting. She served by getting involved, and involvement led to connections. Connecting and serving at lunch at the Crossroads, our homeless ministry here, she did that for years. Participating in Asheville First, our outreach ministry to the community, every single time it was involved. Participating in mission trips, Pippa Passes with our youth habitat bills in Detroit. That kind of ministry and that kind of hard work was fun for her, believe it or not. But it was more than fun or corny, it was joy a joy that nurtured her soul. Pause. This is the third week of Advent, a week of joy, a time when we recognize not fun, not happy, but God's fulfilling gift of joy. Two days into her hospitalization, in pain and exhausted, Corny sent Joanna to retrieve Christmas gifts from her house for my grandchildren, knowing that Martha and I would show up at the hospital and make sure those gifts were delivered. While the bag contained four separate but identical gifts, they were symbolic of that one gift from God, the gift her life so greatly exemplified. Here is one of those gifts, the gift of joy. Four stars, one word, joy. Of course, for Corny, joy came in the form of people. Some of you have experienced this. When you were at a restaurant, or a gathering, Corny, Corny would strategically place herself in the middle of things. She wanted to know what was going on in your life, everyone's life, every little detail. She remembered all that stuff too, because it mattered. Because it mattered to you, it mattered to her. For 12 years, she was also the voice of First Baptist Church. As the receptionist here, she was the first line of communication and connection. Always kind, always loving, always helpful, always patient. In those days, before computers and GPS, the staff relied on her for information. Who did what, who was connected to whom, where did they live, and how to get there. Because people mattered to her and because she loved them, Corny would remind the ministerial staff and that's not really true. She would tell the ministerial staff who needed a visit or a call and when and where it needed to happen. That need for connection continued into the days of Corny's first smartphone and her discovery of emojis. Raise your hand if you've gotten a text from her with emojis in it. Yes. All right, well... If you ever got one of those texts, she always finished it. She finished it off with those little symbols that represented her feelings. A heart, a smiley face, crossed fingers, thumbs up, balloons. Not surprisingly, those emojis represented many of the gifts of Advent. Hope and peace and joy and love. Except for that one time she texted me and she ended it with several hearts a thumbs up, and something that really confused me. Now, I know that Corny loved chocolate, so I thought, well, maybe she thought this is what that <laughs> emoji was. But it wasn't chocolate. It was a pile of brown, but it wasn't chocolate. 
Corny lived and loved herself into all of our lives. Married to Dr. West for 58 years, bless her soul. That was a true love story that is full of stories. I'll tell you one or two. That courtship began in Winston-Salem, where Corny was teaching and Wes was in medical school. Wes lived in the basement of a duplex apartment, and Corny and her roommate lived in the apartment just above him. During the evening, Wes would study, and occasionally Corny would be typing. The old duplex had thin walls and thin floors, and Wes could hear the clackety-clack-clack of the typewriter when he was trying to study. So in his infamous communication style, Wes would take a broom and bang on the ceiling until Corny either stopped typing or went to a different place in the apartment so as not to disturb his studying. Well, now this form of communication eventually led to conversation and visits and occasions where Wes, knowing that the girls upstairs were pretty good cooks, would come and knock on the door to see if they had any leftovers for dinner. As time passed, these leftover visits from Wes became a regular event. But one evening, the girls finished dinner, cleaned up, and trashed the leftovers. Then came the knock on the door from Mr. Leftover himself. Not realizing who it was, sorry, realizing who it was, Corny's roommate went to the door while Corny dug the leftovers out of the trash put them on a plate, and serve them to Dr. West. And then, there, and then there was Dr. West's old VW bug. A VW bug you had to push downhill and pop the clutch in order to get it started. Well, their relationship had progressed, and Corny's parents were coming for a visit. And, of course, part of that visit was for Corny to introduce Wes to her parents. Unfortunately, the night before, Wes forgot to park the VW on a hill. Instead, it was parked in the duplex parking lot. Just as Corny's parents arrived and she was greeting them, two guys were in the parking lot pushing an old VW and yelling, push, push, pop the clutch, not knowing that one of these boys was soon to be his son-in-law. Corny's dad asked, who are these crazy boys and what is going on? To which Corny replied, I have no idea. (laughs) And she quickly turned her parents' attention in another direction. Much later in their life, Wes took up bike riding. That passion turned into tandem riding with Wes in the front seat and Corny in the back, tandem rides that took them all over the States and Europe. Wes did it because he loved to ride. Corny did it because she loved Wes. But as Corny would admit, she also enjoyed the travel, meeting new people, and, of course, shopping. On rare occasions, rare occasions, Martha and I would bike with them. Some of you have been on one of Dr. Wes's level bike rides. This is his definition of level, you know. Level bike rides. Yeah, level my foot, a ride that before it's over, you're on at least a 6% grade, walking your bike up a hill while the Garbies are merrily pedaling along in front of you. However, on one of those rides, Martha and I, each on our own separate bikes, And behind Wes and Corny, we were always behind Wes and Corny, 20 years younger, 50 yards behind, struggling to keep up. But on this particular day, we see it. Wes is pedaling away, pedaling, 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 pedaling. Corny is relaxed, not pedaling at all, on the back of that bicycle and reading a newspaper. Love stories. Kina and her grandkids. I remember the, day, the days when Corny 
<clears throat> was Hank and Joanna's biggest fan. All those sporting events, volleyball, softball, tennis, your greatest cheerleader. But when the grandkids came, it was a whole different level. When Thomas, first grandchild, was four or five years old and into trucks and backhoes and bulldozers, Corny would research construction sites in the area, and Thomas and Wesley and Corny would go on field trips to see all these machines in action. And even though Emma and Paige and Will, you were nine hours away on the other side of the state, Kena was also your greatest supporter. It didn't matter whether it was cheerleading or horseback riding or baseball, she made sure to know what was going on with you and how you were doing. Now, being a die-hard Wake Forest fan, and I do mean die-hard Wake Forest fan, your grandmother's love for you was evident when she managed to put a Clemson or a Georgia sticker on her car. And God forbid, Paige, if Kena ever rooted for anything Chapel Hill, but she did because of you. If pictures I have seen on her phone are correlated with her love for you, then Thomas and Wesley and Emma and Paige and Will, all of you are deeply, deeply loved. As a matter of fact, I would say there are 20 pictures of you to every one of your parents. Does that mean she loved you 20 times more? Corny's love for all of us was easy, full of joy, full of hope. It was steadfast, and it was fearless. Fear not. Do not be afraid, said the Christmas angel. I bring you good news of great joy. We all better understand that good news of the gospel. We understand the great joy because of Cornelia Garvey. And those Christmas angels continued, Glory to God in the highest, and on earth, peace to those with whom God is pleased. God is certainly pleased with Mrs. Garvey, and she is at peace. For some out there, when life threw them a curve, they never recovered. Life threw Corny a curve 30 years ago in the form of cancer. But she not only recovered, for those last 30 years, Corny thrived. She lived and she loved every minute of it. That first week in the hospital was the week of hope. We hoped for courage as we moved into the second week, the week of peace. And we knew that in her death, Corny was indeed at peace, even though we ourselves were lost. Now in this third week of Advent, we come celebrating joy. The joy we all will continue to find. We all will continue to find in our memories and our stories of that wonderful instrument of joy, Miss Corny Garvey. One last word to the family. Pause. On February the 3rd, Thomas and Emma, the other Emma, the new Emma, not cousin Emma, Thomas and Emma will be married. Corny really wanted to be at that celebration and experience that joy. Even in the hospital, Corny and Joanna were planning on a shopping trip so Corny could have just the right Miami outfit, whatever that is. She, of course, will be there in spirit. So raise a glass. Raise a glass at that reception. Remember Kina and hold on to the memories and be joyful. And Corny's last words, maybe, to the rest of us could be summed up in that little Christmas song. 
Now make sure you have a joyful little Christmas. Let your hearts be light. Next year, all your troubles will be out of sight. Faithful friends who are near to us will be near to us once more. Someday soon, we will all be together if the fates allow. Until then, we all have to live and love somehow. So have yourself a joyful little Christmas. Amen. I'd like to begin by saying that if the only thing Cornelia Garby accomplished in her life was to give us Hank and Joanna and Thomas and Wesley and Emma and Paige and Will, and we know she accomplished so much more than that, but if that was all she did, she would have lived a very successful and meaningful life. I'm grateful to know all of them. And when I think about Cornelia Garby, 
three things come to mind. The first one is knickknacks. The first time I went to their house on Charlotte Drive, I knew that they would be there forever because they could never move. Because wherever you went in that house, whatever shelf, whatever wall, whatever mirror, whatever floor space, wherever, there was some little carved or ceramic or pewter statuette, literally millions of them. And we learned, my friends and I, that you could neither sneak in or sneak out of that house at night because it was booby-trapped. <laughs> the second thing I think of when I think of Cornelia Garby is poppy seed cake. Every time we came to visit Hank in Asheville, she always made a poppy seed cake. And man, they were delicious. But on a quite, maybe a little deeper level, the other thing I, I know about Ms. Garvey, um, it was kind of unfortunate for her when she met all of Hank's friends that are here today, including myself. We were in that period in life when we were in college or shortly out of college, and we were still a little bit rough around the edges. We were still immature and still sowing some wild oats. Um, but she never, although she never condoned or took any joy from our idiocy, um, she also did not judge us. She did not lecture us. She did not hold, withhold her affection from us. She still loved us, and she still cared for us, and she shined a bright light on the right path for all of us. And every time we were here, um, we always were invited and welcomed, maybe even gently encouraged to come to church with her, but never forced. And whether we did or not, she served us Sunday lunch. Um, and I kind of like Mary this time of year, she just watched our shenanigans and she kept all those things and she pondered them in her heart. <laughs> and she also trusted that God was not through with any of us. She knew that God loved us and that God was with us and pursuing us and that with the passage of time and through the grace of God, we all would grow and mature into men who were blessings to families and to our communities and to our churches. And I'm very pleased to say that she was right about me. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. I'm just, I'm, I'm kidding. We, all of Hank's friends who are here today who who knew Cornelia through the years and who received birthday cards from her and letters of encouragement from her, we have all grown up and we've come to be, um, I think, the men that she hoped that we would be. And I think she's very proud of that and, and very proud of Hank. Um, but, you know, we're eulogizing Cornelia. We're not deifying her. Okay, so I have to tell one mistake that she made that, that I'm aware of. Um, there was a, a weekend, and this was before Sarah had come into Hank's life, so understand that. Hank invited some of his friends from Winston-Salem, from Charlotte, from Atlanta to come up and play golf one weekend. And he said the tourists are playing and that the Marshall Tucker Band would be playing concert after the game. So we're like, all right, cool. So we all drove two and three hours to be there, and we gathered at the tourist game, and when it was, the game was over, we're like, Hank, when's Marshall Tucker coming out? He said, soon, soon, soon. Well, it turned out that it wasn't the Marshall Tucker band. It was some amateur jug band night. And I said, Hank, what, what's Gibbs? He said, well, I had to tell you something to get you up here. <laughs> he didn't realize the poppy seed cake was enough. Um, but we did, we went to the game, and then we went and played golf the next day. But Hank's mom had told us, she said, tomorrow night you need to go to this new seafood restaurant. There's a new seafood restaurant that opened up, and it's going to be great. Y'all need to go try it out. Well, 
you know, I'm usually a little squirrely about eating mountain seafood. But we said, okay, we'll go. And we drove and we drove and we drove around the windiest roads I've ever been on for, I mean, 30, 40, 50, an hour, minutes. Um, and we finally got there. And I think half of Buncombe County was there waiting in line. And so we waited and we waited and we waited. We waited about two hours to get a table. And, you know, I, once we finally sat down, I don't know if it was because they had a bigger crowd than they were expecting and they ran out of food, or I don't know if it was our hangriness and impatience at getting a table, but I'm pretty sure that our shrimp and flounder plates were tadpoles and brim that they called in the creek out back. Um, and when we told Corny about our experience, she said, oh, well, sorry. <laughs> Funerals and celebrations of life are probably the greatest tempest of emotions that we ever experience in life. I don't know that there's a setting where we simultaneously experience so many conflicting feelings at the same time. But one of the truths of life is that love and pain are two sides of the same coin. If we love and we love deeply, we will eventually feel pain and grieve deeply. Um, and so we come today, and I know many of us feel blessed that we have known and loved and been loved by Cornelia Garvey, this extraordinary woman. At the same time, we are grieved and deeply saddened that she will not be a part of our day-to-day -day lives going forward. Um, we're thankful today for the gift of eternal life and the hope that it brings to us. At the same time, we also may feel anxious or doubtful or afraid of what the future holds without Cornelia here. Some of us may even deal with the scary reality of our own mortality at an occasion such as this. But you know, all those conflicting emotions and perhaps even the tears that they conjure are validated by Jesus when he cried at his own friend's funeral. His friend Lazarus. It's one of his most human moments. But we're not without hope. We can feel all of those things, but one thing that we cannot feel today is hopeless. We are not bereft of hope. And, you know, at Christmas, Christ does not just come to us, but Christ is Emmanuel, God with us. Christ comes, but Christ stays. And so whatever it is that we're feeling in all of the whirlwind of this day and the weeks ahead, God is with us, and God will support us and sustain us through it. But even beyond that, we're not bereft of hope because Christ not only comes and Christ not only stays with us, Christ comes for us. Christ comes to reconcile and reunite us with God. And therein lies our hope today. In the parable that Leah read from Mark, Jesus is out ministering and teaching. And the leader of the synagogue, Jairus, comes to him and he says, My daughter's gravely ill. Please come. And Jesus starts making his way to Jairus' home, but he's interrupted because there's a bleeding woman who grabs hold of his cloak, and he's got to stop and heal her, and the crowds are just swarming him, and eventually another messenger comes and says, well, don't worry about it. She's already passed. But that didn't faze Jesus. Jesus says, don't worry, just have faith, just believe. And so he continues to make his way to the home of Jairus. And when he gets there, 
there's already a crowd of mourners wailing, screaming, crying outside the door. And Jesus says something really strange. He says, why are you crying? I mean, it's almost like he's making fun of them or saying something cruel. And I learned this from author and, and theologian uh, Frederick Buechner a long time ago. He wasn't making a joke at their expense. He was teaching them something about who the Son of God was. When he told them, she's not dead, she's asleep. You don't need to cry. He was saying, look, I'm the Son of God. For me, waking somebody up from death is no more difficult than waking them up from an afternoon nap. And so then he walked in the house and he took Peter, James, and John and the girl's parents with him. And he went into the bedroom and he said, Talitha kum, little girl, get up. And lo and behold, she did. And then he said, give this girl something to eat. So our hope today as Christian people is that we are people of the resurrection. And as Anne Lamott says it so eloquently, for us, death is not the end of life. Death is only the end of dying. And so I know, last Thursday, about 10.15, I know that Jesus came to Corny's room. And I know that she saw an outstretched hand. And that she reached out and she grabbed it and found it to be the hand of God. And then she heard the words, Talitha Coombe, little girl, get up. And when she put her feet down, she realized that they were on the celestial shores of heaven. And then Corny took a deep breath and found it to be the invigorating air of immortality. And then she looked up into the eyes of her God and she felt joy and she felt peace and she felt love and she felt life like she's never experienced before. And at that moment, she knew that she was home. Thanks be to God.
after our benediction, if you will remain seated for our postlude. Now go in the grace of God. Go knowing that God is with us. Go toward Christmas in celebration of those wonderful gifts. Remember joy. Remember Miss Corny Garvey. And remember God's love for you. Amen. <laughs>